Good evening. The horror was over in minutes. 87 people died, most from smoke inhalation in the illegal after hours club. We have an update for you now on that terrible fire in the Bronx overnight. 87 people were killed when someone set fire to the Happy Land Social Club in the East Tremont section of the Bronx. The suspicious fire races through the packed Happy Land Social Club in the Bronx, killing 87 people, the worst in New York in 79 yeah, years. Scenario. People killed with savage swiftness by a fire that raced through the illegal bar and dance club, cruelly named the Happy Land Social Club, where 87 people died this morning in the Bronx. Rending scenes followed as people grieved, some silently, others in emotional outbursts. <laughs> When you talk about the Bronx and think about all the history there, sometimes it can be really easy to forget all the unique qualities that make this borough so different from all the others. I mean, just think about it. The birthplace of hip hop, for one. The biggest park in the city, Pelham Bay Park, not Central Park. Arthur Ave in Little Italy. The Bronx was home to John F. Kennedy in the 1920s when he lived in Riverdale. Even the first haagen family business was in the Bronx, where they would serve ice cream from horse and carriages on the streets. Currently, the Bronx is seen as a place rich with culture, and there are a lot of plans to expand and change the borough. But what about the Bronx's past and how it got to where it is right now? Let's go back to a time when the people who called the Bronx their home were left to fend for themselves and endure some of the darkest moments in this city's history. The Bronx section of New York City is separated from Manhattan by the Harlem River, south of Westchester County and north of Queens, New York. Named after European settler Jonas Bronk in the 1600s, the Bronx was originally called Renanchua by indigenous Americans, the Soanoi tribe. Throughout the history of the Bronx, to say that the borough has been dealt a tough hand would be an understatement. But for a lot of people, the rough times started before they even reached the Bronx. A good example of this would be how the Great Migration for Puerto Ricans started. A lot of families in Puerto Rico were beginning to have a hard time surviving on the island. It was a current climate where work was hard to find for many. Faced with the decision of having to stay in Puerto Rico and wait as things got worse, or possibly go hungry without a way to feed their loved ones, families would end up taking their chances and migrating north to none other than New York City. A lot of parts of New York City were segregated, but the Bronx is a whole different story. Italians, Jewish families, Albanians, Blacks, and Puerto Ricans, among others, all resided in the same community, creating a melting pot of culture unlike anywhere else. But this isn't saying that there weren't issues between those people throughout the years. One of the first major blows to the Bronx would be when Robert Moses, first chairman of NYC Council of Parks, displaced 1,500 families when his idea of building an expressway right through the middle of Tremont would come to be. This, of course, would be the Cross Bronx Expressway. While this area of the Bronx was already known to have cultural significance, Moses would make it seem as if placing these people in new homes posed no issue. He was met with harsh criticism, but plans continued. The disregard of people who'd been speaking up against this would become an all too common theme in the Bronx. Families with dreams of owning homes in sections of the Bronx would be met with disappointment when they couldn't even get approved for loans to make the purchases. Even those with steady income working at the same place for years weren't approved. However, for white families, loans were approved almost constantly, all while the media portrayed the Bronx as a neighborhood ruined by those who came here to start new. Fifteen years ago, the neighborhood was Jewish and Irish with a scattering of others. Now it's a neighborhood of the others. Although this was somewhere that many considered home, residents would begin to see their neighborhood change. The streets became dirtier, the trash in the streets became a pile up. Landlords were selling off their properties, leaving the Bronx sitting in ash and rubble for years. 150,000 people were also displaced and poured into the Bronx, since Manhattan was being gentrified and living there was too expensive. Families were forced into even smaller homes in conditions that weren't suitable for them. Conditions like moments where there was no heat or water. Families would have to go outside and use the fire hydrants to fetch their own water, since these so-called landlords wouldn't do anything. New landlords wouldn't operate the boilers in the coldest winters. Families would use their stoves for heat. The old wiring in these buildings couldn't even handle the newer and more powerful appliances. Buildings wasting away and owners making no money would lead to the infamous fires that began in the late 1960s. In 1968, the Bronx would see residential buildings begin to go up in flames. As the fires continue to spread throughout the Bronx, it would become apparent that this issue wasn't receiving the prompt response that it deserved. In fact, it would be learned that in order to try and reduce the cost of fire protection in the city, firehouses were being closed. 
John O'Hagan, former FDNY commissioner in chief, would state that numerous firehouses would be shut down. The only problem here was they were all being shut down in areas that needed them the most. Poor neighborhoods where fires ran rampant. Areas where lesser fires never had their houses touched. It was as if a decision was made to simply let the Bronx burn to ashes. 80% of the Bronx housing stock was destroyed throughout that time. Up to 40 fires a day would burn on throughout the 70s. Due to the tense climate and frequent fires, families were starting to get used to living life paranoid, putting shoes out near the front door, or maybe sleeping in their shoes, just in case if they needed to run out of the building at a moment's notice. While everyone could see these streets burning day in and day out, to some, it wasn't clear how this was happening so often. Who was to blame? Somehow, the blame was shifted to the residents who lived there and not the landlords who were orchestrating the arson themselves. Pretty much, politicians and those in positions of power were trying to give the impression that people were setting these fires because there was something wrong with them and they had a disregard for human life in their own community. But this wasn't the case. These fires were planned and we'll come back to those shortly. The Bronx burning would become just one of many residents' troubles, as it would also become clear that there was a major neglect and abandonment when it came to the Bronx. Rubble and garbage would become all too familiar within the streets, and to top it off, the Bronx was pretty much used as a garbage dump. Sanitation trucks would come dump trash into the streets, and by the end of the day, the trash was then relocated to the other areas. This was done in hopes of saving money with gas, since just one trip would be made from the Bronx to the dump. The constant sight of such things would start to sadden and anger Bronx residents. Residents who realized that even though this was their home and where they rested their heads, nobody outside of the Bronx seemed to care. The children of the Bronx would partake in using the rubble and debris of their decaying neighborhood as their playgrounds, jumping from abandoned building windows onto stacked up mattresses below, making the best of their situation. As the years went on and things didn't change, the harsh realities of living in a high crime neighborhood would take its toll on the once younger generation. Children who were becoming young adults would begin to fall into some of the bad habits they'd grown so used to seeing. Drug use would become common among those who felt like they might have had nothing else. Feeling stuck and frustrated with the way things looked to be going, it was easy to see how these people could fall into bad habits. Gang activity in the 70s would also become a very common activity on the streets of New York in general, but in the Bronx, Gangs would begin to form on every block, but some of these gangs would act as a way to keep residents safe in the buildings they were so used to seeing go up in flames. Gangs in the areas meant a lesser chance of others invading the area for trouble. Protection from vandals looking to rob and steal from residents. Gangs like the Savage Skulls would become well known in the community, some of which among other young adults would be approached with an offer. Landlords and others tied to some of these abandoned buildings would offer children and teens money in exchange for starting fires in these buildings as a way to get insurance money. Of course, to the young people who were living in this environment, the ones who had little opportunity to make money, getting offered any sum of cash to burn down an already damaged building was an easy choice to make. But sometimes, the blazes that were set took innocent lives with them, just further adding to the already deep-rooted and saddening experience. The media would spend the entire thing and make it seem as if the Bronx was just full of people who wanted to torch these buildings for fun, when in fact, it all came down to money. Instead, the people arrested for arson would flat out state they were paid to carry out the act. But of course, the news never focused on those people, only the ones committing the act. In 1974 alone, the state pool insurance payout for these burning buildings was more than $10 million. By the end of the decade, the number had increased to $45 million. That would be equivalent to more than $250 million if it were done today. And there's no telling how much other insurance companies might have paid out, meaning that number could be much, much higher. And surprisingly, once this insurance money was collected, landlords were no longer required to fix these buildings. They could just take the money and move on. Putting into perspective just how severe this problem was, later on, the city's budget would then come under control of a non-elected state body, and all state services would soon suffer. Budget cuts throughout the entire city would result in the loss of more than 40,000 jobs, just worsening the poverty and living in the Bronx, making families have to look for other ways to support their loved ones. More firehouses would be closed as fires spread across the Grand Concourse, over to the Harlem River, and up to near Fordham Road. When things were as bad as they can get, and the neglect of the Bronx was a harsh and depressing reality, New York would find itself in total darkness during the blackout of 1977.
On this night alone, more than 1,000 fires would burn all through the night on the streets of the Bronx. The huge flames providing the only light in the borough. The effects were devastating. All of the emotions, frustration, and feelings of abandonment would soon result in many taking out their anger on the community they called home. The day after the blackout, there would be hundreds looting through the Bronx. Areas like Prospect Avenue and Southern Boulevard were totally destroyed. Many losing the businesses they'd put their entire lives to. Everything just gone in an instant. Say goes to the railing, he's got some room. And he makes the catch. That is a live picture, and obviously a major fire in a large building in the South Bronx region of New York City. That's a live picture, and obviously the fire department in the Bronx have their problem. My goodness, that's a huge place. That's the very area where President Carter trod just a few days ago. While the Bronx Bombers, aka the New York Yankees, were facing off against the Dodgers at Yankee Stadium in October of 1977, just a few minutes away, live video would show a school engulfed in flames. Nothing new to those from the area, but finally, the millions who had watched the game would get a glimpse of just how bad things were in the Bronx after it had already been burning for more than 10 years. US President Jimmy Carter would visit the Bronx to see just how bad things had gotten for himself. This would result in promises of block-by-block -block renovations and a $55 million grant to help restore the Bronx. There were many promises, but that money never made it to the Bronx. Carter was replaced by President Reagan, and more budget talks were had. More cuts to major programs meant even more severe blows for the Bronx, and the residents of the borough were not happy with it. By 1981, as tensions mounted in New York, films like Fort Apache the Bronx and The Warriors in 1979 would end up using the Bronx as a gritty backdrop to tell stories of crime and violence, and residents of the Bronx were sick of it. These films are called classics for many, but the Bronx was fed up with only being portrayed as a place filled with violence, lawlessness, and no culture. Blacks and Puerto Ricans across the borough would protest, successfully getting the movie removed from some theaters. But the fight to have this movie removed from theaters was a part of a much larger issue, as members of the community knew that if they wanted to clean up the Bronx, they'd have to do it themselves. The rise in popularity of forms of art like breakdancing, DJing, graffiti, the birth of hip hop, would help create a new identity for the Bronx, while others took a more political approach, looking to gain power and make changes for the better. The Bronx was growing louder, the residents were taking a stance, and the new mission for the borough would be to keep fighting, take back their home, and watch the Bronx flourish. Residents were gathered and the mission began. Individuals like Ramon Huera would make commitments, and him and his associates would start the People's Development Corporation, who were some of the first to start rebuilding and fixing the South Bronx. Neighboring blocks would see the work done on Washington Avenue and follow suit. Before you knew it, the Bronx was being restored. Hetty Fox, a community activist, would move into abandoned buildings to avoid them from being looted and would create after-school programs for children. She wanted to create a welcoming environment for them, an environment where kids actually wanted to stay in the Bronx and not get into trouble. She also tried her best to counteract the city's attempts to evict residents. Years and years of hard work would finally pay off when former New York City Mayor Ed Koch would announce a $4.4 billion program to rebuild and restore 100,000 units of housing throughout the city, a lot of them in the Bronx. Affordable housing and renovation offered a glimmer of hope and a feeling of accomplishment for those who'd been fighting tirelessly to make their neighborhoods somewhere safe and suitable to live in. Today on Evil Intentions, the story of the Happy Land Social Club. The Happy Land Social Club was an unlicensed club located in the Bronx, New York. The club was located at 1959 Southern Boulevard in the Bronx. The space, built of brick and wood, wasn't very large and only one story high, 22 feet wide by 58 feet deep. The space wasn't considered elegant or fancy, but to the residents of East Tremont, Southern Boulevard, and other areas of the Bronx, the space was more than just a place to have a drink and listen to loud music. 
This club meant to residents of the Bronx what places like the Palladium and the Copa meant to residents of Lower Manhattan. The social club was theirs, somewhere the residents called their own. Happy Land to Many was a place where people of different backgrounds, primarily Latinos, could unwind and be surrounded by their people, listening to the music that they were raised on without having to travel all the way into the city. Even though the location might not have been the most luxurious, it was a welcoming atmosphere, somewhere that anyone and everyone was welcome. After years and years of turmoil and rough living in the Bronx, locations like Happy Land, El Hoyo Social Club, and Puerto Rican Social Club throughout the 70s and 80s were locations that people in the Bronx held near and dear to them. They fought so long and hard to be able to own and operate places like this that letting them go was really hard to do. For some, this was a main source of income, but the truth was that the Social Club had a lot of issues and this would pose a big problem later on. Happy Land had a long list of those types of issues. The illegal club had only a partially working sprinkler system, no working fire alarms, no fire escapes or windows, and it had just a front entrance to exit and enter through. A staircase in the back of the social club wasn't often used. The staircase to the front of the club was very narrow, and in order for someone to walk up or down the stairs, they would have to let someone pass first, since two people wouldn't be able to walk at the same time. It was also said that when it came to entry to the club, the people working there didn't check IDs. If you had enough money to cover the $5 entry fee, then you were okay to enter, even if you were underage. There was a serious lack of enforcement of the safety regulations back then. The location often became very overcrowded, which was against code. Some of the decorations used within the walls of the club were flammable. Add to this the liquor being illegally sold and the patrons being intoxicated, and you can see how all of these factors could lead to a big problem. Even though there were citations and orders to close, records indicate that there was never any follow-up from the fire department. And if there was, it was never documented. All the dangers in the location were well known to city officials, who had already ordered that the club shut its door in November of 1988, for some of the same reasons mentioned above. Now despite the dangers, the threats, and the warnings of having this place shut down, the doors to Happy Land remained open. Now a big part of this was that the city was either unwilling or unable to try to force these places out of business. But on the morning of March 25th of 1990, one man's vengeful and hateful actions would lead to the end of Happy Land and lead to one of the darkest moments in this city's entire history. During the weekend of March 25th, 1990, celebrations were had in the Bronx amongst his Honduran residents. Among those celebrations was a large group in attendance for a 50th birthday party at the Happy Land Social Club. The Honduran community is also known as the Garifuna community, an indigenous growing community of people with culture heavily rooted in African ancestry, living along the Caribbean coast of Honduras, Guatemala, and Belize. The Garifuna community has a population upwards of nearly 300,000 inhabitants and they have a long-standing history going as far back as the 1700s, a community that's come a very, very long way. And on this night, people were looking to just let go of whatever issues they had and spend the night celebrating, dancing, and embracing their culture, surrounded by others doing the same. And so the party went on. But as it got later and festivities continued, at around 2.30 a.m., a man and his ex-girlfriend had an argument on the second floor of Happy Land. The argument was between a woman named Lydia Feliciano and her ex-boyfriend, a man named Julio Gonzalez, a man determined to get back in Lydia's good graces after a messy breakup. Gonzalez was an ex-convict who fled Cuba, had been recently fired from his job at a lamp factory in Queens, and he had been struggling to make ends meet and pay his rent, resulting in engaging in street activity to make money. Lydia had been living with Gonzalez on and off for about six years, but their relationship had become more of a burden filled with stress. Gonzalez wanted her back, but she simply didn't feel the same. Lydia was employed at the Happy Land Social Club as a ticket taker and coat checker, and Gonzalez had a real problem with this. He didn't want her working there, but Lydia was over this relationship. During their argument, she would let Gonzalez know that she wasn't taking him back, and she had plenty of other people who could potentially replace him. Even Lydia's family had advised her to move on since they knew something wasn't right about him. Gonzalez would persist and persist until Lydia became sick of it and tried to walk away. Gonzalez would grab Lydia as his anger grew, and a bouncer would quickly come and break up the commotion, kicking Gonzalez out of the club around 3 a.m. She's my woman, not yours. A drunken belligerent Gonzalez would continue to argue with this bouncer in front of the club when Gonzalez says something that wouldn't be forgotten. Regresaré a cerrar esto. 
which translated to, I'll be back to shut this place down. Gonzalez would say those words and then walk off into the opposite direction. The bouncer he had been arguing with just assumed that he had went home and that he was just a drunk guy who was angry. But as promised, a short time later, Julio would be back. But this time, it wasn't to talk. Gonzalez continued to walk into the night, angry, hostile, with no job and little money. He could have let it go, and if Lydia wasn't going to take him back, he was going to make sure that she wouldn't live to be happy with anyone else. He would end up on East Tremont and Cretona, where his vengeful plan was first conjured up. Just a few blocks away from here was an Amico gas station on 174th and Southern Boulevard. As he walked there, he would come across an empty one-gallon oil container and try to purchase one dollar worth of gasoline. He would tell the clerk at Amico that his car broke down just a few blocks away. The man behind the counter, a Lehman College freshman named Edward, found this to be odd and at first refused to give Gonzalez what he asked for. That's until another man who'd been near the gas station told the clerk that he knew Gonzalez and that he was fine. So, Edward gave him what he asked for. He would make his way back to the club. Normally, out front, you might see people talking or having a smoke, but on this night, everyone remained inside, upstairs on the dance floor, thinking of nothing more than the moment, dancing the night away. A vengeful Gonzalez would begin to pour gasoline in the space between the front entrance and the second door that led to the stairwell. Those at the top of the stairwell could see a dark figure doing something in the darkness below, but it just looked like someone moving around. They weren't alarmed. Gonzalez would then strike matches, take a step back, and set the front entrance to Happy Land up in flames instantly. The flames were at first only in that space that he initially set fire to, but of course there were many more dangers other than the flames. Lydia, who had just had that fight with Gonzalez a little while ago, would see the flames engulfing the front of the club from the coat check area and began to scream, Fuego! Fuego! She did this in an attempt to alert everybody inside the club. Gonzalez would walk across the street and watch the flames grow, as if he was admiring his own work. There was no turning back now. At 3.41 a.m., March 25, 1990, Engine 45 was on their way back to the firehouse when a call was dispatched via radio. They responded to Emergency Reporting System Box 2974 on Southern Boulevard in East Tremont. Engines 88, Ladders 48, and 38, among others, responded. When firefighters arrived, the ground floor blaze was quickly controlled. But soon enough, the horrors upstairs would be revealed. The walls of the Happy Land Social Club were filled with death, as bodies upon bodies would be discovered. The bodies at first were mistaken for trash bags that had been stacked up. The firefighters tried their best to use their flashlights to cut through the thick smoke that filled the club. Firefighters who responded to the blaze investigated their surroundings and noticed that the floor to the club felt soft, as if it would be collapsing soon due to the intense flames. But they were horrified to learn that the softness they felt under their feet wasn't the floor, but the bodies of those who perished. Some people had been trampled to death, others had tried with all their might to break a hole through the wall in a desperate attempt to survive. But the mix of intense flames, thick smoke, and toxic fumes would slowly kill anyone trapped within those walls. The stairwell acted as a chimney, sending all of those deadly fumes and smoke in the one direction that everyone was trying so desperately to escape through. As the firefighters went deeper into the club, trying to find their way to the second floor, they'd find victims scattered, and some near and in the bathroom. As one of the firefighters carried someone out, he would bump into a table, and when coming back into the building, they noticed this table was blocking a door and the stairwell. This was done to block that section off to people who might try to enter without paying. Firefighters would find the second staircase on the rear of the first floor, and when they reached the second floor, the same horrific discoveries would be made. On the second floor, several of the sprinkler heads had gone off, pushing the thick smoke downward toward the first floor. Big holes were cut into the roof of the building to help ventilate the area and have smoke pour out, but because of the sprinklers, this didn't do anything. A firefighter recalls having to crawl over dead bodies for more than 20 feet, reaching all around him, feeling the lifeless bodies stacked on one another. The reality of this horrific event finally dawned on everyone who never expected to see something truly terrible take place in such a small space in such a short time. As the bodies continued to be pulled out of the Happy Land Social Club, the numbers just kept piling up, eventually reaching a death toll of 87, the most deadly fire in the history of New York City at the time, since the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory of 1911 in Manhattan. 
which eerily enough happened on the exact same day. 78 of the 87 victims were identified as Honduran. The Honduran government declared three days of national mourning. Gonzalez was arrested the very next morning when authorities went to his apartment and noticed that his room smelled of heavy gasoline. He had simply left the scene of the crime, went home, told his roommate that there had been a fire at his ex's job, and went to sleep, not even staying awake long enough to truly accept the severity of what he'd done. The hateful actions of one jilted lover would cause 87 families and countless loved ones pain and emotional trauma for the next 30 plus years as residents of the Bronx still mourn and remember those lost. On Monday, March 26th of 1990, Lydia Feliciano, the woman Gonzalez had been arguing with, would show up to public school 67, dressed in a black coat with a leopard print collar. Many, very much still in shock at the devastating loss, were appalled to see Feliciano showing her face when this entire thing started with her. But the truth was, this wasn't her fault. She had lost people too, friends and colleagues. Still, the anger and emotions running high during a tragedy would lead to many questioning why she made it out alive while so many others had died especially when she was the one meant to be harmed. But no amount of questions could ever bring those lives back. The one to blame is the man who couldn't let this woman move on without trying to end her life. A man who went to extreme lengths to make sure that someone, anyone, paid for the anger he felt in that moment. The man to blame is and always will be Julio Gonzalez. On September 19th of 1991, Julio Gonzalez was sentenced to 174 25-year sentences, totaling out to 4,350 years. But in September of 2016, he would suffer a fatal heart attack while behind bars. Anytime a tragedy like this takes place, the city is reminded of a dark history. A dark history of a borough up in flames. A history of a celebration turned deadly, and a borough that always comes together for one another when all the dust settles. Rest in peace to all the lives lost that day, and my deepest condolences go out to all of the families and loved ones.